Hi, Jane. Hi, Stuart. So this is very exciting for me to be having a conversation on stage with you because I spent the last year having a conversation with you in my mind uh -oh, okay. <laughs> while I was writing my book. Um, the last chapter in my book, it's called Saving the Real World Together, um, and it's looking at big future forecasting games and getting gamers to think long term. We even have a design for a thousand year game huh. that, you know, with the goal of having uh, at least 50% of the planet playing the same game by uh, the end of the first 100 years. And so uh, I was thinking a lot about your work, your ideas about seizing the millennium, um, but also your illustrious career as a game designer, which is, uh, you know, I brought my copy of the new games book. I don't know how many people here are aware of Stuart's illustrious career as a game designer. Some of my favorite games growing up are in this book, and actually one of the reasons why I'm a game designer is because you um, and some of your friends out here in the Bay Area decided to start a games movement. Now, I don't know if it was explicitly to change the world. It definitely had that ethos yeah, it was about actually. it. You want to hear the origin story? Yes, please. The Juicy. Origin, <laughs> the origin story is I was hanging out with Gregory Bateson in those days. Um, this is late 70s getting on into, no, actually early 70s. And um, he had been there when Theory of Games was developed by Jonathan Neumann. And we were talking about that and the Cold War, which was still in full tilt at that point. And he said, the theory of games is really brilliant, but it has this terrible lack, which it does not have within the theory any theory of how to change the rules. I thought, ooh. And I thought, you know, when I was a kid, we were changing the rules of games all the time. So we'd play baseball out in the side lot next to the house I grew up in, and there really wasn't room for three bases, so we figured out how to play baseball with two bases. And, uh, and we would change the game according to how many kids there were actually there to play and so on. And I thought, all kids know about changing the rules of games, except the ones that get stuck in the little league world or something like that. And, but then grown-ups get into this mode of teaching little league and following big league and going by, these are the rules and that's the way it is, folks. And I, I looked at games like professional football, and I thought, there's actually four teams on the field. There's the team A and team B. We're almost exactly like each other. Not very interesting variation there. Then there's the referees. That's a really different group of people. And then there's the audience. And with television, a huge audience overlooking this whole thing. So there's these four entities actually determine how professional football moves forward. That started me in the mode of, well, if we're ever going to get out of the Cold War, we're going to have to change the rules by which we're playing it, because it's a game which must not be won by anybody. Mm -hmm. And so the intent of the new games tournament, uh, I initially did it with a thing called World War IV. Uh, I was hired by the War Resisters League to do a public event for them, and I, I said, well, let's have a war. <laughs> and Very counterintuitive. <laughs> by, by then, it was too late for them to say you know, no. So we went ahead in a war, and I invented some games for them, Earth Ball and, and a, a game called Slaughter, which they loved. Um, because what I knew what would be the case is these were usually mostly young men who were facing the draft. That's who the War Resisters League was, Vietnam War. And what they needed to do was bodily fight and not get killed and not be involved in a big stupid mission and so on. And uh, they dearly loved it. So I invented games they could do that. And they were violent, they were right on the edge of getting hurt, but you know, one of our rules was play hard, play fair, nobody hurt. And that was part of the design problem. So the idea of the new games tournament was new games. Um, okay, we're gonna have a great big tug of war and let's get a hawser 300 feet long, it's about that big around. And the uh, first deal was a Le Mans start. So the people on two sides of this creek had to stand back 10 feet away from the rope. I fired a starter gun, cow, and everybody had to run to the rope, pick it up, and start pulling. That was kind of fun. went on for a while. And uh, one of the things I noticed is the onlookers would see the, the team they were closest to starting to lose, and then they would go join the rope. And so it, it balanced back and forth and went on for quite a while. 
So they what? wanted to keep the game going. They were, they were like what, defecting. Yeah, we'll come back to this. <laughs> this is, I think, the important point. Because um, then the next thing we do, okay, that was violent and interesting because people ran into each other and so on. Let's make it really violent and interesting. And the deal is that you have to uh, go across the, this canyon uh, between the two teams and grab the rope on the other side. Bang! And so the two teams are running through each other in the bottom of this creek bed, tripping each other up and clambering up the other side and then not knowing whether to run out and grab the rope at a distance or all crowd up. And then, you know, so everybody's figuring out the strategy as it emerges around them. It's a complete melee. People <laughs> loved it. Wow, can we do that again? So what I was discovering is that the fun of play was for people to get in this mode, like kids, of how can we make this game more interesting? That was the, the, the breakthrough that made new games work. And um, the, the somewhat more candy-ass games wound up in the book. The, the violent ones that I thought were way more fun for people, which were much more grab-ass. Again, it was you know young males and females I learned from hanging out with American Indians that games that involve a certain amount of contact, not actually violent, but contact, uh, is most fun for young people. And that also was part of this action. So that's the story of the New Games Tournament. That's a good story. So I was thinking we could take this opportunity. So one of the founders of the New Games, one of the uh, lifelong students of the New Games, um, still making games, trying to change the world, I am, that we could take one of these awesome games and think about reinventing it for the future. So I was thinking the, the Earth Ball game, right? So how many of you guys have played with an Earth Ball, right? A lot of people said That's ginormous. a surprising number, actually. Was yeah. it, it's like 250 times the size of a volleyball. Is that about the right? I believe that was a reference that you guys Yeah, an Earth Ball was a six foot high push ball, as they were called, a cage six, ball. Six feet high, wow. And my big breakthrough was to get a friend, Roy Seaburn, and it has a canvas to paint it like the earth. Yes. And then we had to you know, was, uh, get it to one end of the field or the other. Yeah, OK. So here's what I'm thinking. So I, I know that in the historic accounts of Earth Ball, that apparently sometimes people would want to keep the game going so much, rather mm -hmm. than have one side win, they right. would switch sides. And the yep. game, is it true that a game Just went oscillate. longer than a day? Is that true? It should be. Yeah, it should be. It could have been. <laughs> that's the legend. That's the mythology. Day and night and day and night. Yeah, day. which I, I could believe because I know um, the, the kind of games that we make were totally based on that idea of the infinite game. A finite games, you play to win. Infinite mm -hmm. games, you play to get as many people into the game as possible and to you keep it going. You play to improve the game. And to make, right, game, mm -hmm. the rules must change in order to, to make go. it better. So Do any of the online games have that quality at this point? Um, <laughs> that you can change the rules? Uh, none, of, none of the major games uh, have, have where you can change the rules. What they do have is where you can design your own level, where you can, um, yeah. And, and then share it with other players and get feedback on mm. whether that it, that level is fair, whether it's engaging, whether it's fun. Um, so there is definitely a sense of learning that's happening, I think, with gamers, that most gamers are getting now their hands dirty mm. with design. And so it's sort of helping them think about, uh, about how to make a good game. And what I'm thinking... Are there a lot of people like designing iPhone games, app games, because it's sort of cheap and easy to do yeah. that compared to a big you know, deal game? Yeah, well, it certainly lowered the, the, the threshold for, for, designing, uh, for designing games and getting something out mm. there. Um, although, actually, there's a, there's a whole new movement of people to design like 8-bit games um, because there are these computers being sold in developing markets that are like educational game consoles and they come with a cartridge with 250 games. I mean, it's just like your, literally just like your old Atari cartridge. Um, and there's this great opportunity to, instead of reselling and developing game communities, old Atari games, we mm -hmm. could sell them new games. Like, what are the games, the mythologies and stuff? We mm -hmm. want to have them growing up. And that's a really low threshold for uh, even I, who I'm not a good programmer or coder, even I could. Uh, that's great. Could make that. But so I'm thinking, because I want to do global. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like Tiffany. I want to have every, everybody in the mm -hmm. whole world collaborating. So I was thinking, what if we tried to design an Earth Ball game that um, was a 10-year game? 
I, w I need your help designing this. So some of the things that I'm thinking about, because the goal of this game would be, well, there'd be a couple things. You'd really have to think at a planetary scale, I think. Mm -hmm. So you'd want to put the, the boundaries, or, uh, the, where the goal is, maybe like at the poles or maybe the west coast and the east coast if it was just a US game, but that doesn't seem fun enough to me. But so we'd have to think about, I need your help designing where the, the, the goals should be. Um, and then to figure out, you know, where can you go over the next decade? And if, if you know, maybe we put a goal in North Korea, for example, and what would that mean to have, by the end of 10 years, m moving towards, uh, you know, millions of gamers getting the ball in the goal? Just for example, to think, you know, out, out in the realm of the crazy, um, you know, is there a game that we could design that would marshalize people, you know, around some, some really epic, epic goal across the planet and, and, and to keep the ball safe for 10 years. Yeah, this is a, I would treat it as a your own metaphor kind of deal where the, 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 you know, the, the earth and the earth ball are in some sense merged. So one of the things I, I learned from watching people mess around with volleyball which people do mess around. It's a very forgiving sport. You can do it with you know, various numbers of people on each team and so on. And as soon as they get into the mode of uh, let's screw around with the rules, one of them, one of the rules that turns out to be very popular with people is um, how about the deal is all the rules of volleyball apply, um, but the goal is to go as long as you can before the ball touches the ground. And so instead of trying to spike it at the net, to you know, get it to the ground before the other team can get to it. You're lobbing it over the net so the other team can get to it and they do their three hits and they lob it back over. And it turns out to be very difficult. But what's neat about it is it's like the last two minutes in football. It gets very tense. And you're screaming for somebody you know, to commit their body to make the huge dive to make yeah. the save for to e keep the, the game going for yeah. everybody. Yeah. And, and it, um, you know, it's, it is a sweetie pie game. It's very collaborative and all of that. On the other hand, uh, the side that finally drops the ball uh, feels terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing that, that and, and you mentioned that when the earth ball goes from one end of the field to the other, people wind up uh, trying to keep it going and people actually defect to this team that's almost about to lose. So one potentially interesting thing, okay, another version of, of earth ball that is amazing to me that people totally invented is you've got this six foot high ball it's pretty heavy and uh, people discover that they get on their back and put their feet underneath it they kick it straight up there and then the deal gets to be how high can you kick it but then another bunch of people gather around them to uh, be sure that no matter how high they kick it it doesn't go out and fall on the ground and spontaneously there becomes this flame of a kind of a fountain or earth ball going up and up up and down for hours, and the deal is wow. to keep the ball up, and the people on the underneath kicking it up all in use, one, two, three, ah! You know, they get exhausted pretty quick, but by then the people who've come over to see the weird thing going on have gotten sucked into the game. When somebody is totally losing it on the ground, somebody else fills in. So, so could an be. interesting earth ball game would be to have maybe two earth balls, maybe more, start with two, and they start in an Antipodes, uh, antipodes, opposite sides of the earth, and the deal is that they will progress around the earth in opposite directions, maybe they start like this, and ideally pass each other, and whoever gets to uh, the same point, having gone all the way around the world, uh, and you'd have some rules about you can't use airplanes and stuff yeah. like that, but you've got to keep it in the air the whole time. People have got to personally hold up this heavy Earth, wow. the whole time, and that if you know they're standing on a ship, they're standing on a ship, <laughs> and there's television, there's all the other stuff, and um, maybe neither team will win. Maybe they drop the ball, or maybe uh, you know one actually does come out ahead. But it's an epic thing that everybody gets to watch. That's one go. I love that. I love. I mean, it's it's metaphorical without being obnoxiously full of content and and you have to do this. I mean, it's, it's sort of instilling that, that, like we were saying, this irrational myth that we, the earth is on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. To sort of instill that. Yeah. that Atlas didn't shrug, we'd call it. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that sounds controversial. <laughs> uh, how would you do the game, and then we'll wind up here? Okay. <laughs> how would you do that? Oh, game? how would I do that game? That mm -hmm. particular game? The Earth game, yeah. The, the Earth game. Well, um, I mean, actually, I was really struck by your idea of uh, or your visualization of the ball going up and down. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the Olympics are something interesting to reference because of that idea of the Olympic flame to keep going. And like, what would it mean to come and relieve somebody in the circle, right? Mm -hmm. And how big could you make the circle and how many balls could you keep going? And it's almost like having a, you know, the long now clock in the mm -hmm. desert. Could you put something like this in a desert somewhere? And this becomes its own kind of mecca or pilgrimage for people who want to you know experience taking care of the earth and there's an infinite game that they can go and join yeah. for a period of time yeah. just like having a lifetime on the real earth yeah i like okay. it all right we're in i'll see you next week for the first design meeting yes we're, let's we do it here <laughs> so wrapping up i've got one question is there anybody in this audience who's actually been here through this whole event i'm awed <laughs> Just bear in mind, this is one tiny fragment of the long conversation, which we call civilization. Uh, it's been very interesting to have this little highly faceted fragment of it. Uh, I should be saying thanks to the Contemporary Jewish Museum for having us here. Thank you indeed. And at this very moment, our words are being parsed by So So Limited out in the lobby and uh, sliced six ways from Sunday and revealed to us as uh, holding deeper truths. Thank you to so so. And I believe that Long Player has exactly 160 minutes left to play of the current set of the thousand year uh, musical event that is going on across the street. And I recommend you have a taste if you haven't yet. It is, uh, it is a step out of the busyness of time that we've been talking about much tonight into this other frame of reference. And that's why we love it so much at Long Now. Thank you so long. Bye bye. <laughs>